because we are spending the day in the future, there's that other H.G. Wells book called The Shape of Things to Come. That's the title of what we're going to be hearing about next from Dr. Alder Alvernus and then from Dr. Zaya. And I will leave the stage for that. done a series of features talking about what life is like if you're 18 or 50 or if an 82 year old. What they ask is how has life changed? What are the innovations that have passed over the breadth of your life? So they got me thinking. My father would have been 100 years old this year. So if I look over the spectrum of what has changed over the arc of his lifetime, the amount of change is extraordinary. In addition to two world wars, extraordinary social change and technological advancement, the advances in my field, biomedical research and healthcare, have been unparalleled. Through his life, he survived the death of two of his siblings from typhoid. He developed Parkinson's disease and ultimately died from metastatic colon cancer. So healthcare had an impact upon him. And the ability of healthcare to make a difference will have an impact upon future generations. So what we saw over the past 100 years was a revolution that came through advances in antibiotics and public health. In the domain of my career in business, we saw combination chemotherapy and radiation therapy used effectively to treat dreaded disorders like Hodgkin disease. We've seen allogeneic transplant provide cures to people with leukemia who would have irrevocably suffered and ultimately died from those diseases over this past 100 years. So as we sit and think about what happens over the next arc, what does the next 100 years bring in biomedical research? A lot of what we've talked about today forms the basis of what I think will frame the future. And I, as we think about this very clearly, we begin to see that CERN is a unique nexus for how that changes. But at this point, I want us to think a little bit differently, which is what happens next is trans-scientific. The translation of what we do here from abstract ideas and amazing science to things that change people's lives for the better involves more than just navigating the perils of understanding gene manipulation, DNA-based research, the evolution of pluripotent stem cells, or the retargeting of the immune system. It also involves helping people become educated consumers of healthcare. It also involves coming up with systems that allow us to pay for these advances and to deliver healthcare in an equitable way. So what I'd like to talk about is how does the future frame up in terms of these advancements? How do we change this idea of stem cells from a very compelling but highly abstract idea into something that becomes part of that 100-year arc that changes people's lives and that ensures those who have suffered in the past have taught us so that those in the future never suffer in the same way again? So let's start out with this idea of science. So I remember in the 1970s, Time Magazine had a cover article about magic bullets and how they're going to make cancer go away. Well, what we found out is that that gun was empty. There were no magic bullets. And we learned the hard way that what had been promised couldn't be delivered. And as I said earlier, one of the most important qualities to have as a physician is that of humility. And part of how I've learned that is that caring for patients is a recurring exercise in relearning the art of humility. Because when we're confronted with real human need, we learn that sometimes the palette of solutions and our armamentarium of therapeutics are inadequate to meet the needs of those individuals before us. Yet in light of what we've heard about today and the technological advances that have occurred as a result of this stem cell revolution, we're in a position to think radically differently about what is possible. For a long time, people have pointed to stem cells as this sort of abstract deus ex machina that would make disease irrelevant and that would cure every disease. And in some ways, that's bred a level of cynicism. 
that these things were kind of there the same way that magic bullets were there 40 years ago. But today what you've heard is tangible evidence that these technologies have a real ability to change and affect people's lives for the better. We were able to see glioblastomas melt away with CAR T cells injected into the ventricular space. We were able to understand sirtuzumab and novel molecules targeted at new targets or new antigens that we didn't understand before. So if you think about what's possible from a scientific basis, this idea of stem cells as a path towards multiple solutions for unmet medical needs doesn't seem like an abstraction anymore. Now, we don't have all the answers, but we do know that we know better questions. And CIRM has taught us that we have a framework through which we can answer those questions in meaningful ways that I believe will translate into concrete solutions for patients. What are the possibilities? I think realistically, with these stem cell technologies that we've talked about, HIV could be a curable disease. ALD and other neurodegenerative disorders and muscular degenerative disorders could be conquered. Blindness could be altered. This idea of retinitis pigmentosa can be changed. So what we've realized, and, and this is really where we've come full circle, as a cancer doctor, our paradigm was more chemo, more radiation, more radical surgery. And part of what's powerful about this moment and about these technologies is that it isn't more, more, more of the same damn ineffective, toxic thing that didn't work before. It's changing the paradigm by availing ourselves of something extraordinary which is the infinite potential of pluripotent tissues to change an effective neurological system. The infinite plasticity of the immune system to be retargeted against the cancer in a way that was unimaginable a decade ago. It's that ability to leverage the 19,000 to 20,000 genes within our genome in a way to revise that data and information to retarget our tissues and make them more effective in concrete, real ways that will change the lives of people. You've seen the evidence. You've seen the pictures. You've seen sirtuzumab, and you've seen anti-glioma directed CAR T cells and retinitis pigmentosa repairing cells injected into the eye. This is tangible proof that these are not simply abstractions, but things that will translate into genuine technologies. The search through these 50 trials and through the level of ambition that CERN is bringing to this really puts us in a much better position to change people's lives through technology that isn't just more, 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 it's better and thinking differently in a far more concrete way. I believe this is navigable. But we have other challenges, and this is where we get into the issue of the trans-scientific mindset, which is you can create good science, but it doesn't guarantee that people get access to it. Let's think a little bit about this. Most of us go into medicine and seek out to do better by people out of altruism, belief, and the idea that the questions that we ask on a scientific level are navigable, answerable, and that they can change people's lives. As a young person, that's how you become a scientist and why you stay a scientist. It's the ability to know that the unknowable is knowable and that it can translate into a meaningful affirmation of what we seek to do. On the other hand, there are charlatans, liars, thieves, and snake oil salesmen. And we shouldn't underestimate the devastating impact that these people can have upon the lives of patients. You heard Dr. Gold allude to Jim Gus. He's someone that the New York Times wrote about in June of 2016. And this is a person who, after his stroke, was seeking to repair his lingering neurological deficits, as any of us would want to do. And he sought out stem cell therapeutics in China, Mexico, and Argentina, and spent $300,000 getting these stem cell therapeutics. And what they did is they led to irrevocable damage. So, so part of what we need here isn't just the idea that we're going to pioneer stem cell therapeutics. Part of our responsibility, which extends beyond the science, is to help prepare patients and or health care consumers, which may in fact be payers. It may be government. It may be legislators to understand what is possible and what is false. Because if you can tell people this is why this is true, 
and give them the tools to succeed, then the potential is immense. And, and, and just to give you a parallel of the democratizing nature of, of, of this knowledge, think about the internet. The internet was created in the early 1960s as ARPANET, something that connected a bunch of geeks and cubitals and a bunch of academic centers and DOD sites to post a bunch of stuff on bulletin boards. It wasn't until the advent of the World Wide Web in 1991 and the subsequent explosion of that that we were able to give people access to the unfettered potential of what was there. But they had to know about it. And it had to be accessible. And it had to be communicated in a way that made it accessible. Part of our CERN mission is to ensure that we communicate in a way that engenders that level of engagement. If I can go to Amazon or another website to look to find cheaper coffee or a better product or, or even buy this coat, we should be able to understand and help our patients get better access to information to make fundamental choices about life or death, about improving their health, and to do so in a way which is facilitated curated and imparted with the expertise that you've seen exhibited in this room. I think this is, beyond the science, part of our obligation is to prepare people so that they can be effective consumers in pursuing health and wellness in a highly complex marketplace where many are unethical and many are willing to take advantage of that vulnerability. The other obligation is something that is always of concern to me, which I'll say it this way. Healthcare is not equitably available to people. And this is a challenge. I think we're excited about the potential of these therapies and potential cures. Yet, they're not that exciting if you think that they might be available to only a small percentage of those in need. Now, this isn't a unique situation, particular to the idea of stem cells. Think of infant mortality. Infant mortality of a baby born in West Los Angeles is as good as anywhere in the world. It's as good as Sweden. Infant mortality in Mississippi is worse than infant mortality in Botswana. This is true. You can look it up. It's on Wikipedia, which is the source of all truth. <laughs> so, so what I'm trying to tell you is that we have extraordinary systemic inequalities in how healthcare is delivered in the United States. Part of our obligation at CERN and as members of this CERN community, is to engage with payers, people throughout the states who develop Medicaid policies, individuals throughout the United States who, through their various mechanisms, ensure that care is good, effective, patient-centered, and adequate. Part of that quality conversation has to involve us imparting our knowledge and understanding to those who seek to do better. And in saying that, I think we also have to have part of a conversation that has to do with price. This idea of patient financial toxicity has become part of the lexicon over the last five to 10 years. And if you look at someone getting care for cancer, like colon cancer, their typical average out-of-pocket cost is about $10,000. For some people, that means the decision between bankruptcy or getting care of their cancer. We need to make sure that as we look at these solutions, that we're not blind to their economic impact because the economy and cost of these products ultimately influences how accessible and how meaningful they are. So what we do in our mission as CERN and as members of this broad community all seeking to change the nature of the next 100-year arc is that we have to approach this in a way which we realize the full scope of responsibility not to get overly Spider-Man on you, but with great power comes a greater responsibility. I'm not Uncle Ben, but I, I think the sensibility was a right one. And with the great potential that you've heard about these stem cell therapeutics, it's not good enough just to be a scientist. You have to be an advocate. You have to be a communicator. You have to be a storyteller. There is great power, not just in the scientific discovery or in the knowledge that a fact is in fact true, but it's the idea that you can weave that into a broader narrative that changes policy, that increases the potential that somehow these things will not only influence those lives before us, but influence all those to come so that we can avert the suffering of the next series of generations who are at risk. 
Part of the mission that we've taken upon ourselves isn't just that of discovery. That's a narrow, dangerous, scientific vision, one that threatens to disenfranchise us from the broader social responsibilities and necessities that we have to embark upon. Part of what we do here is that we're messengers, we're evangelists, we're changers and we're storytellers who have to ensure that these discoveries have re relevance and resonance well beyond this room or the laboratories in which we work or the clinic rooms where we see our individual patients. So, so I can't predict the future. And it's gotten particularly difficult since Miss Cleo went away and the Psychic Friends Network closed <laughs> to be able to tell you how this ends in 10 or 20 or 40 or 50 years. But I go home and I have small children and I look at them. And what I aspire for most is that the world that they inhabit is better than that which my father inhabited it. And that all the potential, all those threads of knowledge, all those ways in which human existence and life can be ameliorated through what you've heard about today. Part of my responsibility is to ensure that's part of her birthright, that that's her expectation. So as we look upon what's been done here today, we've heard extraordinary stories, not only of patient courage and of families seeking out to do better, but also we've heard the opportunity for us to leave a great legacy that changes lives to come. It's in that way that we have to go out today and tell a story, one which begins here and ends when the next generation is free of the dreaded diseases that we've discussed today. Again, I thank you for your time and your energy, and I look forward to helping to make this future work.